right now in the Red Sea, inside the Combat Information Center of the USS Kearney. The air conditioning is humming, but Commander Jeremy Robertson is sweating. He is staring at a mathematical nightmare. On his radar screen, 20 red dots are closing fast. Not cruise missiles, not fighter jets, drones, cheap, plastic, flying lawnmowers built in an Iranian garage. Each one costs the Houthi rebels about $20,000, the same price as a Honda Civic. To stop them, Robertson cannot use bullets. He must use miracles. He has to fire SM-6 interceptors. Each missile costs $4.3 million. Run the numbers with him. 20 drones, that's a $400,000 attack. To defend his ship, he must fire 20 interceptors. That's $86 million in defensive fire. Clear, salvo fire. In a flash of light, the annual tax contribution of 5,000 American families disappears into the night sky. For every dollar the enemy spends to attack, American taxpayers must spend $215 to defend. That is a bankrupt strategy. No nation on earth can afford to win that way. The enemy isn't trying to sink the destroyer. They're trying to bleed it dry, flooding the zone with cheap garbage, forcing the U.S. Navy to burn through a finite supply of diamonds. It looks like checkmate, but the critics don't know what's been happening in classified Pentagon labs for the past five years. While Robertson holds the line at sea, a woman in Washington, D.C. saw this nightmare coming long ago. Vice Admiral Seiko Okano, the brain behind integrated warfare systems. She decided to stop playing the dollar game. She switched the currency to pennies. If you're proud of American innovation that turns an enemy's smartest strategy into a joke, type proud in the comments right now. Today, we're breaking down three revolutionary weapons that cost less than a burger to fire. How they save enough money to rebuild entire communities back home. And why by 2026, the question won't be, can America afford to defend? It'll be, can the enemy afford to attack? Let's start with the word that scares destroyer captains more than torpedo. Winchester. Robertson knows that word intimately. Naval aviators borrowed it from Air Force fighter pilots. It's the radio call that means your guns are empty. Your missiles are gone. You're out of ammunition. For a destroyer captain, hearing Winchester doesn't just mean the fight is over. It means abandoning your post because of one brutal physical reality. The vertical launch system on an Arleigh Burke-class destroyer holds exactly 96 missiles. Not 97, not 100. Each cell is a concrete tube, 25 feet deep, built into the ship's structure during construction. You can't add more cells. You can't 3D print missiles at sea. You can't bolt on extra tubes when the swarm hits. Once those 96 cells are empty, a $2 billion warship becomes a $2 billion paperweight. USS Kearney knows this math intimately. During Robertson's 2023 to 2024 deployment to the Red Sea, the ship faced over 50 separate Houthi attacks, drones, anti-ship missiles, coordinated swarms. The crew fired more than 40 interceptors defending themselves and nearby commercial shipping. 40 missiles gone, 56 remaining, barely half the magazine. Robertson feels sweat trickle down his temple in the air-conditioned CIC. Every time he authorizes another launch, the countdown continues. 55 left, 54, 53. Here's what keeps destroyer commanders awake at night. When the VLS runs low, there's only one option. Disengage from the battle group, steam to a friendly port, wait for a crane, wait for a supply ship, wait for specialized teams to reload each tube, one by one. The process takes weeks. Picture Robertson's dilemma. 20 red dots on the radar, each one a potential threat. Fire too many interceptors now. Risk Winchester before relief arrives. Fire too few. Risk a leaker penetrating the defenses and hitting a civilian tanker. Or worse, hitting the carrier he's supposed to protect. The stress is paralyzing. Every launch is a tactical decision and a logistics nightmare wrapped into one impossible choice. 
Veteran destroyer commanders have described it as playing poker when you can see the enemy's cards. But your chips are running out. You know what's coming. You just don't know if you have enough bullets to stop it. For decades, this was the iron law of naval warfare. Finite magazine, finite protection, run dry, go home. But three years earlier, in a Pentagon briefing room, Vice Admiral O'Connor was already solving Robertson's nightmare. TRAM, Transferable Rearming Mechanism. This was O'Connor's first move, not a weapon, a logistics solution, engineering grit at its finest. To O'Connor, the challenge wasn't just logistical, it was a physics nightmare. She often described the problem to her engineers with a brutal analogy. It is like trying to thread a needle while riding a roller coaster. Now imagine that needle is a two-ton explosive missile, and the roller coaster is a destroyer pitching in 10-foot waves. That's tram. Here's how it works. A supply ship pulls alongside the destroyer while both vessels are underway at sea. Both ships moving at 15 knots, both rolling in ocean swells. A specialized crane extends from the supply ship across the gap between the hulls. Missiles transfer directly from the supply ship's hold into the destroyer's VLS cells, cell by cell, tube by tube. No port, no pier, no crane infrastructure, just two ships moving together in the middle of the ocean, rearming while the battle group continues its mission. The first time Robertson watched a tram reload, he stood on the bridge wing as a 3,000-pound SM-6 swung across open water on a cable. The ships rose and fell on different wave cycles. The crane operator had to time the release perfectly. One second too early. The missile crashes into the deck. One second too late. It swings back and collides with the supply ship, threading the needle on a roller coaster. But it worked. The missile slid into the VLS cell, lock engaged. The crane swung back for the next round. The destroyer that fired 40 missiles yesterday can reload 40 missiles today without breaking formation, without abandoning station, without leaving the carrier group exposed. For the first time in naval history, Winchester doesn't mean retreat. Tram eliminates the weeks-long port return. It keeps ships in the fight. But back in Washington, O'Connor knew Tram wasn't enough. She stood in front of a cost projection slide that made admirals wince. Even with at sea rearming, the economics still favored the enemy. A destroyer could reload faster, stay in the fight longer, but every engagement still burned millions of dollars to stop thousands of dollars worth of threats. She looked at the cost projection slides and realized the uncomfortable truth that everyone else was ignoring. Using tram solved the movement problem, but it didn't solve the money problem. In her view, the Navy was essentially using a crane to reload gold bars just to throw them at garbage cans. Tram solved the logistics problem. It didn't solve the cost problem. That required changing the ammunition itself. Okano had been working on that solution for three years. Robertson didn't have the luxury of this technology on the Kearney. He had to fight the hard way, with grit, limited ammo, and high stress. But 8,000 miles away in the Pacific, on the USS Preble, the Navy is proving the weapon that Robertson wished he had. The weapons officer on the Preble sits at an upgraded console. His screen shows a different solution, a button labeled Helios, high energy laser with integrated optical dazzler and surveillance. He's trained on this system for six months under Okano's accelerated deployment program, but he's never fired it in combat until now. His finger hovers over the button. He presses it. Hollywood lied to you. Real lasers are scary because they are boring. No muzzle flash, no recoil, no smoke, no tracer rounds arcing toward the enemy. Just invisible infrared light, focused into a beam narrower than a pencil, traveling at 186,000 miles per second. The drone never sees it coming. The Houthi operator watching his video feed never gets a warning. The targeting computer locks the laser onto the drone's center mass. Helios fires. A 60-kilowatt beam converges on a spot smaller than a quarter. In less than one second, that spot heats to over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Plastic melts. 
Carbon fiber softens. Aluminum begins to glow. The drone's sensor dome, made of cheap acrylic, cracks from thermal stress. The camera lens inside warps. Light-sensitive chips overheat and short-circuit. Within three seconds, the drone is functionally blind. But Helios doesn't stop there. The beam stays locked on target. Four seconds. Five. The drone's cheap plastic propeller blades start to deform from the heat. Six seconds. The motor housing begins to melt. Seven seconds. Control surfaces warp. The drone doesn't explode. There's no fireball. No debris cloud. It simply stops responding to commands. The propeller keeps spinning for a moment, driven by momentum. Then the drone noses down, pitches forward, and falls, like a bird with clipped wings, tumbling toward the ocean below. The weapons officer watches it drop on his infrared camera. No missile contrail streaking behind it, no explosion on water impact, just a small splash in the dark sea. The diesel fuel burned to generate that seven-second laser shot cost 87 cents. Back in Washington, Vice Admiral Locano watches real-time feeds from the USS Preble. This is the validation of five years of her career. Every Helios engagement saves $4.3 million versus an SM-6 intercept. She thinks about what that money means. Not in Pentagon budget terms. In American lives, one laser shot saves enough to build an elementary school in Ohio. Ten engagements fund a fully equipped cancer research laboratory. That's not just a cost saving. That's choosing schools over sinking metal into the Red Sea. This isn't just a weapon. It's an economic shield, thousands of miles away on the Kearney. Robertson is still fighting the old way. He doesn't know help is coming. But O'Connor does. On the Preble's screen, another red dot appears on the tactical display. The weapons officer rotates the targeting reticle, locks on, fires again. Another drone falls. This is what unlimited ammunition feels like. But there's a problem with Helios that no amount of fuel can solve. It engages one target at a time. Lock, fire, burn. Move to next target against 10 drones spread across the sky. Helios can handle them methodically against 50 drones converging in a coordinated swarm, all arriving simultaneously? The math gets dangerous. Robertson steps onto the bridge wing, binoculars pressed to his face. 53 red dots on the radar, not 15, not 20, 53, all inbound. In 2024, this site would be a death sentence. But let's fast forward to 2026. Let's give Robertson the upgrade he deserves. On this destroyer of the future, the captain has a final card to play. Robertson keys his radio. Weapons, bridge, authorize meteor. There's a pause. The weapons officer's voice comes back. Sir, meteor is still experimental. Noted, fire when ready. This is Okano's final gift to the fleet. Project meteor, high power microwave. In our 2026 scenario, this is the weapon that changes everything, and Robertson is about to find out if O'Connor's gamble pays off. If Helios is a sniper rifle, Meteor is a shotgun, a very large, very angry shotgun pointed at the sky. Instead of a focused laser beam burning one target, Meteor broadcasts a wide cone of electromagnetic radiation, invisible, silent, sweeping across a 60-degree arc of sky, deep in the ship. Four massive Rolls-Royce gas turbines scream to life. The sound reverberates through the hull, a mechanical howl that drowns out every other noise. They aren't turning the propellers. They're dumping raw electrical power into massive capacitor banks. 12 megawatts, enough energy to power a city block, now compressed into a single millisecond. The generators surge to maximum output. Deck lights flicker. The entire ship vibrates from the energy draw. Every sailor feels it in their bones. Meteor fires. Nothing visible happens. No flash, no beam, no tracer. The ocean looks the same. The sky looks the same. But 15 miles away, inside 53 Huthi drones, everything electronic just died. Here's what happened in the span of one second. 
The microwave pulse swept across the formation like an invisible wall. The radiation penetrated the drone's plastic and aluminum skin as if it wasn't there. Inside each drone, the electromagnetic energy induced electrical currents in every circuit, every wire, every trace on every circuit board. Voltage spiked, transistors fried, capacitors exploded in tiny pops, microprocessors cooked from the inside, GPS receivers went dark, guidance computers crashed, power regulators burned out, camera feeds froze, radio transmitters went silent. In Yemen, in a bunker 500 miles south, 53 control screens went black simultaneously. The operators frantically try to re-establish connection. Nothing. They check their equipment. Their radios work fine. Their computers are functioning. But every single drone just vanished from their displays. Back in the Red Sea, Robertson watches through his binoculars. The drones don't fall in unison. Some continue on inertial heading for a few seconds before veering off course. Some tumble immediately. Some spiral slowly, like cutting the strings of 53 puppets. They drift apart and fall. Within 30 seconds, 53 small splashes appear across a two-mile radius. Robertson takes a breath. The radar is clear. The silence returns to the CIC. For the first time in history, a U.S. warship just defeated a mass swarm without firing a single bullet. So how does the U.S. Navy win when every defensive shot costs 200 times more than the enemy's weapon? Simple answer, America stopped playing their game. The enemy built a strategy around ammunition economics, cheap drones versus expensive missiles. Force America to burn dollars while they burn pennies. Deplete the magazine, force the retreat. But America didn't build better ammunition. We built weapons that don't use ammunition. Tram keeps ships in the fight. Helios burns targets for the price of a coffee. Meteor sweeps the sky for the cost of running the generators. And all of it runs on electricity from engines that were already turning anyway. The enemy counted on Winchester. They counted on finite magazines and weeks-long port returns. What they didn't count on was Vice Admiral Okano asking a different question five years ago. Not, how do we make cheaper missiles? But, how do we stop using missiles altogether? By 2026, the question won't be, can America afford to defend itself? It will be, can the enemy afford to attack us? Because we have infinite ammunition, and they don't have infinite drones. By 2027, every new destroyer leaves the shipyard with Helios already installed. By 2028, the Navy's directed energy roadmap includes weapons we haven't even announced yet, railguns, solid-state lasers, Systems that make Meteor look like a prototype. That destroyer in the Red Sea? In the very near future. Commanders like Robertson won't count VLS cells before authorizing engagement anymore. The weapons officer won't hesitate when the radar lights up. They will fire. The threats will fall. The magazine will stay full. The mission continues. And back home, the money we're not burning in the Red Sea builds the schools, funds the hospitals, and advances the research that makes America stronger. If you believe in peace through superior firepower, hit that like button and subscribe. We break down the engineering and strategy that keeps America's military ahead of near-peer competitors and asymmetric threats alike. The enemy thought cheap drones would bankrupt American defense. They thought economics would beat firepower. They forgot one critical variable. American engineers don't accept the premise of the question. We don't optimize within constraints. We eliminate the constraints entirely. The future of naval warfare isn't about who has more bullets. It's about who stopped needing bullets in the first place.